From the arts to the economy, immigrants and minorities have played a key role in building South Florida. We look at the value of diversity and the multicultural traditions that have helped shape South Florida's unique landscape. That and more, stay with us as we dive into your South Florida. Hi, I'm Pam Giganti. Welcome to Your South Florida. According to the American Immigration Council, one in five Florida residents was born in another country, and together, immigrants make up more than a quarter of Florida's labor force. From local business owners to our neighbors, South Florida's immigrant population has helped turn our region into the diverse melting pot and cultural destination it is today. As part of our most recent virtual town hall this month, we partnered with PBS American Portrait, an ongoing and evolving initiative that asks people from all over the U.S. to submit their individual stories by responding to a number of thought-provoking prompts in order to get a better view of the complex and fascinating Portrait of America. We first heard from Senior Director of Programming and Development for PBS, Bill Margol, to learn more about this groundbreaking initiative. Hi, my name is Bill Margol, and I'm Senior Director of Programming and Development at PBS. I'm the editorial lead on American Portrait, and uh, I oversee the project uh, from day to day. It came out of a lot of discussion at PBS uh, after the events in Charlottesville. And the question that we asked ourselves was, what does it really mean to be an American today? And that's a really interesting question. And we decided that the best way to get to an answer to that question would be to get people to tell their stories themselves, um, to create a, a, a user-generated platform through which people could respond to prompts that were thought-provoking. And through that, we would gain insight into what it really means to be an American today. And the, the interesting thing is that that question is the one question that we actually never ask. The whole goal of American Portrait is to get at the answer to that question without asking the question. Is your story... The millions of stories that make up this country. Just regular people like you, me. When American Portrait started, when we launched in January of 2020, I don't think we could have, I don't think any of us could ever predicted the kind of year that would lay ahead. And just how perfect American Portrait would be for everything that's happened in 2020. It's really given people a forum to respond in kind to and in, 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 in real time to everything that's transpired from the pandemic to the issues around racial injustice to politics to everything and what we've done with american portrait is we've pivoted as things have changed within the country we've added new prompts to get people to tell their stories around these ideas around these subjects we added new broadcast specials that we didn't expect to do when the project was started and we've tapped into local communities um, like right there in South Florida, to connect to your audiences, to connect to your community, to find out what are the issues that, that resonate within, you know, within your communities. I think the things that have surprised me really is the honesty and the, the lack of vitriol that we've seen. When we set out, we said, we're gonna open this up. This was never meant to be a rose-tinted portrait of America. We weren't gonna moderate out anything that might be difficult. But the whole goal has been to allow viewpoints that maybe I don't necessarily agree with or you don't necessarily agree with, but they are part of America. But our real hope is that, you know, we can partner with somebody and allow American Portrait to be a window into this time we've, we've lived through. Because I think there's something really valuable about giving people a platform to tell their stories that isn't on social media, that isn't um, where you where you know you're not going to get responses that are filled with some of the you know the worst things that we see on social media, but a real way for people to share their their feelings in an open and honest way. And I think if we can continue to do that, then we continue to fulfill PBS's mission, which is giving people a platform to tell our stories. So 
such an incredibly and important, cool project. I think you're really going to enjoy tonight's program. And we're going to see some of these American portrait submissions from locals later on in the program. But first, let's go ahead and meet tonight's panel. Joining me is Emmy Award winning Cuban American filmmaker and journalist Oscar Corral, Haitian American filmmaker Rochelle Salnav, and executive director of History Fort Lauderdale, Patricia Zeiler. Let's start by taking a step back and kind of looking at the portrait of South Florida. As we know, it's changed a lot over the years. It hasn't always been this diverse. It hasn't always been this melting pot as we know it and see it and live it today. And, you know, even tonight's panel is really a good example of, of just kind of how di diverse we all are. So, Patricia, I want to start with you. I know that the museum has this new exhibit at the Galleria Mall in Fort Lauderdale for the 60th anniversary of the film Where the Boys Are. A lot of people might remember that, which kind of really kick-started the tourism industry, if you will, here in South Florida. But the film also came at a time of segregation. So what does that film tell us about that period of our history juxtaposed to where we are now? It was a low budget film. It really involved the local community and call went out to all, calls went out to all the high schools. A lot of the local kids were in the film. It was $10 a day and free lunch. It was a really big deal. Um, it put Fort Lauderdale on the map tourist wise, but it really called attention at that moment in history in Fort Lauderdale. It was still a segregated beach. There were no persons of color in the movie. Um, and exactly almost a year to the date of filming, July 4th, 1961, was the first peaceful wade in at uh, Fort Lauderdale Beach, exactly at the point where the movie was filmed at Los Olos Boulevard in A1A, led by Eula Johnson, who you're looking at right now, and Dr. Von Meisel. Peaceful wade in to the beach waters and the white beach, demonstrating against the uh, segregation of the beaches. You know, I'm not as aware of Miami's historical Black Beach as I am Fort Lauderdale. Up here, our beach for the African-American community was completely undeveloped, and there was no way to get there except by this ferry. And if you missed the ferry, you were stuck there overnight. You, it, was not, and it was not at all a, 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 an equal situation under the law with the segregated beaches. Yeah, and so some of those pictures that we were just looking at, this is all part of this curated project right now celebrating the 60th anniversary, correct? Is this something we would see if we would go to to, to see it? And walk us through that, because some of what, visiting the museum now, you can also do it virtually, correct? Yes, so the, the exhibit itself is, um, mostly the filming of the of the uh, of the movie itself and the premiere of the movie so it doesn't show as much of the the changes that came just those eight months later when the peaceful demonstration started and then that basically uh legal action that declared the segregation of beaches illegal rachel and oscar let's talk to both of you as filmmakers um and Rochelle, I want to start with you, first of all. Talk about documenting South Florida and its vibrant communities today. And we know that as a, a Haitian filmmaker, you really focus a lot of your attention on that community. So kind of talk about what it's like to be a filmmaker here in South Florida in this diverse community in which we live. Well, yeah, I mean, I've been living here in South Florida for about 10 years uh, before that, Atlanta, and then all my life in New York City. And we talk about you know, a melting pot, um, you know, I, I came from that. So being able to be here, it's been um, a fascinating journey to actually be able to learn how to make films right here at the University of Miami um, and be able to use our background of being in Miami, like our backyard, which is the Caribbean, which is Haiti, you know? from, my parents are from, to tell these fascinating stories. First, personal, because a lot of my work have been so far like personal journeys, um, but also be able to, you know, tell these stories that are, are unique because everyone has a story and you can, you know, you can tell a story about, a macadamia nut tree and you'll get five different stories. It's been a great ride. I'm very proud of the community, the cinematic community here in South Florida. It's grown. Um, 10 years ago, yeah, there was a sort of, it was segregated even among 
the, the Haitian community. It was segregated even among the Black community, the Caribbean community, um, the Latin community. But now today through the arts um, and through organizations like PBS that have helped to give you know, filmmakers like me, a platform to show my work. So I'm, you know, it's been, it's been great to see an evolution happen only within like a 10 year span. Oscar, let's talk about what it's like for you as a Cuban American and as a filmmaker here in South Florida. Walk us through what that's like for you and how that inspires the work that you do. Well, I, I was born and raised in South Florida. My parents are Cuban and uh, I was born here in 1974. And I've seen Miami evolve and change all around me over the last, you know, 40 some years. Uh, at, when I was younger, I remember that almost all the Hispanics that I would see in South Florida were Cuban. And that's just because of the bubble I lived in, but also because Miami's demographics were, that's how they were back then. But, uh, you know, it's incredible to see how Miami has changed over the last 40 or 50 years. It's gone from being kind of a, a, a small, quiet um, town uh, with with a, a strong Jewish community to being this incredibly diverse pan Latin global city that that embraces cultures from everywhere, and so um, now it's no longer just um, Cuban Americans. I remember I remember seeing during the eighties, um, I, I, I you know just seeing uh, Haitians, uh, Nicaraguans, Venezuelans start arriving. Then then later in the nineties, it was Argentinians, the Brazilians, the you know, be, before you know it, uh, you know, your neighbors could be from anywhere. And that's that's the way it is now. And so um, for a storyteller, it's like Candyland. There's so many incredible stories to tell because there are no there are no stories like the immigrant story. I mean, talk about talk about people facing adversity, um, people risking everything, people who uh, inspire and who and who sacrifice. I mean, the immigrant story is is one of the most powerful um, stories to tell as a filmmaker. And so my last film was about immigrant entrepreneurs and it was called Making It in America. And what better place to base that than Florida? So we traveled all around the state of Florida telling stories of immigrant entrepreneurs who had done really well for themselves. And that ranges from billionaires to people who were just uh, starting out and, and, and starting an ice cream shop. So um, that really captured people's imaginations. And, um, and like I said, for, for a storyteller, this is the greatest place to be because um, the incredible, the incredible uh, narratives and the incredible uh, stories you hear, you just want to go out and tell them all. So before we continue, let's take a look at an American portrait submission from artist Omari Addison from Hollywood. He tells us about how and why he keeps his African-American culture alive. Take a listen. Hi everybody, Hahana Fadu. My name is Omari Addison and the tradition that I carry on is Gullah art. Gullah art comes from my heritage, the Gullah Geechee people, and we are African Americans descended from West and Central Africans that were taken to the coastal regions of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, specifically on the sea islands there. And due to the unbearable heat and diseases from mosquitoes, a lot of the white settlers stayed away from those islands which allowed us Gullah people to keep our Africanisms and create a very unique Creole culture there. And one of the very fascinating aspects of Gullah art is that we love to depict our lives in the low country. And one of the things that I love to do specifically with my platform is to educate people on various parts of Gullah history. And I do fear that if we lose this heritage, a lot of people will believe in the many many of the various stereotypes that African Americans have not retained their culture or don't have their own language. We are very important because we are the connection between our Caribbean, African American, our African ancestry. And if we don't keep this together, we will eventually lose a very important jewel in the American South. Wow, his art is so beautiful and so colorful. So important to tell that story. Rochelle, why is it important for immigrants to retain their cultures? And, and your film, La Belle Vie, The Good Life, was really a journey of discovering your Haitian roots. So talk about that. To not retain your culture and your heritage is basically saying, denying who you are. And so I'm so happy that organizations like PBS are moving forward and being able to tell and give people, those platforms. I mean, it's important for me as an artist 
um, you know, I deal with uh, a very, you know, sometimes very complicated issues such as colorism, you know, uh, the isms and schisms within the, the Haitian society um, that is very complicated, but using my a, per, a, a platform, um, using you know my personal my my family to sort of understand that using myself as a case study, it's important. You know these stories can really be able to just you know so it's it's a light switch sometimes for us for the community to understand one another, to understand how this all sort of played a part. Uh, you, you talk about South Florida, I mean, ha the Haitian community is the second largest com you know, immigrant, so-called immigrant community outside of Cubans. I mean, we came here on the same, on the same seas, you know, we probably waved at each other like, oh my God. You know, uh, and and these are stories of triumph. You know, these are stories of finding liberty, finding freedom in in what whatever whatever perception that was in the minds of the people who risked their lives just to come here. For that liberty and and you know these 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 stories are important. And you know, over the years. You know, Cubans here in the community have done a great job of preserving their community, telling their stories. And now, you know, it's time for, you know, Haitians to tell the story. You know, we, we Haitians, you know, a friend said, you know, we're the home of Black Lives Matter. We're the first country, you know, slavery is wrong and we will not accept it. So we will beat the French and we did it. And when we beat French, you know, we were we were the second in the world to to be liberated. I mean, America was the first, and we were we're, we're only seven hundred miles away from America. So who helped who helped America get their freedom as well? Haitians, you know, Haitians were free, eighteen o four. You know, so these are like extraordinary stories that are right in our backyard. Oscar, jump in here and talk about what it's like from your perspective as a Cuban American, as somebody who's brought up in this community. Clearly, that shapes the way you tell stories coming from your own perspective as well. Immigration is one of the topics that, that I love to tell stories about for the reasons I said earlier. And I think that um, we also have to credit immigrants for continuing the uh, spirit and the concept of the American dream, because a lot of people who've been here for generations they may even think that this country has lost some of its luster, that they that this country is on its on decline, that it's that it's not what it used to be. But when you tell stories of recently arrived immigrants who have um, succeeded and who have overcome tremendous odds and who have climbed, you know, who have who had who have advanced themselves through the American system um, and achieved incredible success, I think it it shatters any notion that this country is declining or that there's no more opportunity left here. So I think immigrants inspire not just not just each other, but I think they inspire all Americans to understand that this country has a lot to offer and there, there's still a way to get ahead, um, working hard, uh, studying or, 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 you know, just being entrepreneurial. Um, there's there's just uh, no limits to what you can accomplish. And I think immigrants are the are the type of people are immigrants embody that spirit. So um, it's important to keep immigrant stories alive for that reason as well. Um, just to show that there's incredible success to be had in this country. You can you can get ahead. You can work hard. You can strive, and so um, and so. I, I think I think it's just a great topic. Patricia, you recently wrote an op-ed in the Herald, in the Miami Herald, about uh, museums being challenged to sort of rethink their place in light of the killing of George Floyd and the continued fights for racial justice. So tell us a little bit more about that and what you mean by that. Museums, for the most part, have been um, not uh, welcoming to diverse communities. They have been uh, largely funded by white philanthropists that were not concerned with a real good um, representation of the community itself. So I think museums, especially through this COVID time, we've been working really hard on diversity and equality and accessibility issues. 
Um, it's one thing that's uh, it's, it's very much stretched by our national organization, the American Alliance of Museums. Um, it, in South Florida, especially, I think sort of the waves of, of history as we go along, when you look at both Miami-Dade and Broward County, in the late 1800s, both of these counties were largely African-American. Um, uh, Henry Flagler said 400 folk, uh, African-American men into Broward County to uh, build his railroad. And there were only like about 70 other folks along the river. So um, basically it was already a minority majority county, but those same men who stayed and helped to build this fledgling town were not counted in the 1900 census. Uh, I agree that, that, you know, very thankfully the days of segregation are over, but I really believe that the, in, in our communities, especially with the Jim Crow South laws not being removed until the 50s and the 60s, and you figure George Allen didn't bring uh, the, the, the suit to, to integrate Broward County schools until 1970. So these are not old historical topics. These are a lot of folks today who lived under that segregation who that was their experience. So we need to listen to them and understand that um, those are the experiences of different communities and, and, and a part of the fabric of the entire community and not a separate issue. We're all part of the same, the same community that lives today in South Florida and has to, um, you know, have that empathy for each other. You know, I, one of the things we've worked on here is a lynching project with the museum in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, you know, a, a lynching in South Florida was a common occurrence, not at Civil War times. The last lynching in Broward County was 1935. There are still people who were children then who are alive and will tell you the story of that day. So, I mean, I think uh, a sensitivity to those issues, it helps us to, to open those channels of communication today among all the communities. All right, what we wanna do right now is take a look at our next American portrait submission. This one is from FIU student, Isabella Simon. She shares with us how her mom, Adriana, wrote her own American story. Take a look. Hi, so I'm here with my mom. So when did your American story begin? Well, my American story began when I was 17 and my parents were kind enough to allow me to come to the United States as an exchange student from Guayaquil, Ecuador. And that program was going to allow me to be here for a year and learn the culture and the language. So I went to a wonderful city in Ohio where I had the chance to uh, show, I guess, a, a different side of me in sports. And that's where I kind of was discovered and then given an opportunity to apply for a volleyball scholarship. At the end of that journey, I was very fortunate to be given the, the chance to come to Miami, to FIU. So coming here was very, very hard because I was completely by myself uh, in a different country, my, I guess my English skills were not 100% yet there. And it was just very hard to be by myself in a new city and with no family, no friends, believe it or not, and no one, and then trying to make it and to succeed in, in, into college. Imagine that. So I worked really hard. Uh, I studied and worked. And I made it, you know, I graduated in the School of Hotel Management. So it's, it's a wonderful field where Miami happens to be the place for tourism. And I was able to grow and to build the career that I have now and build my, my wonderful family. It was a lot of work, a lot of sacrifice, mm -hmm. but it was all worth it. So how would you like to, to, to write your, your American story? Well, obviously, I want to make sure that, you know, you guys know, my grandparents know that all their sacrifices were for a reason and it paid off in the end because I became a successful American, as well as, you know, continuing those traditions from Ecuador and Cuba, since my other side is also Cuban. I'm fortunate that I was born here exactly. and I'm an American citizen that I know both languages, which is a great advantage in this country. So. So yeah, just take advantage of that and 
hopefully build my career here and my family as well and continue oh. your legacy of, <laughs> in America. Thank you so much. You make me very proud. I love that. That's so beautiful. The, the mom's so proud of, of her daughter and yeah. And Oscar, you kind of touched a lot when you did Making It in America, which we've already talked about, you really touched on that whole entrepreneurial spirit. And there really is um, an economic, economic diversity here in South Florida. So doing that film series, what did that teach you kind of about the human spirit and about survival and about making it in America when it comes to just that economic independence? Well, the, the story we just heard is a great example of the kind of uh, uh, gung-ho entrepreneurial spirit that it takes to come here. I mean, you're talking, you know, it's, it's a woman who came here um, by herself with no family, no friends to start over. And uh, she's made something of herself. She graduated from hospitality school and she's a successful, I guess, uh, hospitality executive. And, and, and her parents uh, and, and her daughter is the product of an Ecuadorian woman and a Cuban man. I mean, that, that's, that's just, that's Florida. That's Miami. And so, uh, you know, Miami's like that. It's, it's full. It's, it's this incredible mix of people. Um, and they, you know, they, they, they date, they marry, they produce uh, other beautiful people. And, and it's this great mix of, of nationalities. And so uh, making it in America was really um, kind of showing the economic side of that, which is uh, that immigrants come here and the risks they take often lead to tremendous success because they're willing to do things and willing to take risks that maybe people who are, are native or who were born here are not willing to do. So um, they oftentimes achieve great success and they create jobs and they, um, they're pillars of their community and they strengthen the economy. And so um, that is visible all over Florida, not just in Miami, but we film people everywhere. We film entrepreneurs in Jacksonville, Orlando, Tampa, um, you know, uh, 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 Naples, uh, all over the, all over the state. And, um, in the end, I think what it what it really shows not just not just the film, but the story we just saw and, and these other great immigrant stories, is the is the fact that the, you know the, the American dream lives on through the spirit of immigrants who come here and they uh, they beat the odds and they make something of themselves and they make the community a better place. For anybody who's watching this and feels really inspired and wants to create their own American story. How should they start? I mean, it's is it is, is it just as easy as grabbing your cell phone and putting it up on a tripod, or how, how should people start? If people are out there listening, um, it, it's never too late. Uh, it, it, just pick up your phone and start telling the story of your family. If you have children, um, interview your children. Um, and you don't have to make this public. You can keep it in a private server. You can keep it privately for yourself. But um, document these things because um, I think that the phone, the smartphone has provided a tremendous, tremendously impactful tool um, for telling stories, for journalism, and for, uh, you know, just, just for, for helping each other, helping to understand each other better. Make your local museum aware of the films that you are doing so that they can help promote them. And then if you will, leave them as a legacy with the museum so they can use them for future generations. It's a really important part of our story. And the video, of course, we've switched to video histories now rather than oral histories. We don't do, we have a, a bank full of the oral, but, you know, the video histories, what we do with them is, is uh, edit them and then immediately put them out on our YouTube channel so people can enjoy the story. A reminder that the American Portrait Series is still going on. To submit your story, visit pbs.org slash American Portrait. We'll see you next time. Until then, be safe and have a happy and healthy new year.